Yeah. All right, so a special edition of Lauder with Crowder today. And I know when people think, oh, this is a, this is a montage edition, it's like a, like before Happy Days went away. Right before the Jump the Shark was yeah. a montage. Uh, but this is actually something that we haven't done before, but a lot of people have asked uh, me to talk about some of my favorite guests that we've had in the show. And sometimes there's, there's a little bit more that's happened behind the scenes that um, we just don't really get to fill, fill yeah, you guys in on. Uh, and I do have some favorite guests, some standout guests. So we're going to give you the top 10 guests uh, that have appeared in a lot of Crowder. And why they're top 10 to me, and then I'd love to hear from you uh, who your favorite guests have been or who you'd like to see uh, on the show. Comment below. We always want to hear from you. So Number 10, uh, a guest I loved having on the show just because he was such a, he, talk about a gentle giant, world's strongest man, well, four times, and then four-time Arnold Classic strongest man, so eight times really, uh, Brian Shaw. Maybe it's seven. Who cares at this point? The point is he's really strong. And That's, huge. Uh, episode 357, you can go reference it for Mug Club members. A lot of these are on YouTube, but some of them are behind uh, uh, Mug Club only. Yep. Uh, the fun. full version or sometimes an extended version. And yep. the reason Brian Shaw was so interesting to me was because not only was he, he big and obviously strong and intimidating and I soiled myself, but um, <laughs> I found I've been really fortunate to interview excellent people, people who are the – as a matter of fact, I was trying to tell – an older relative about Brian Shaw. She was like, well, I guess that would make sense how you're impressed by him being strong. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. It's not about the strength. Do you understand what this guy has done to achieve this, to become yeah. the best at anything? And uh, talking with him about it, you can you can see a, a borderline, and I mean this in a good way, obsessive personality about attention to detail and quality. And you see this with any of the people we've interviewed who are at the top, top level of their field. And uh, one thing for me that really stood out, episode 357 with Brian Shaw, I always wanted to ask this, four-time world's strongest man was also the runner-up more times than anyone else against his oh. biggest rival, uh, Zadrunas uh, Zavikas, I think is how it's pronounced. And before the torch was passed to Brian Shaw, it wasn't even close. This Zadrunas guy was in a league of his own, and, and Brian Shaw kind of, he, he evaded it a little bit, but I asked him, you know, he finally just really was, uh, he was as candid as could be, and that was a breakthrough moment in that interview. Uh, enjoy. You went on to win four times, but like you said, Zavikas was your main rival. And there is uh, a moment, I remember when I was watching World's Strongest Man, I can't remember which year it was, but it was, okay. it was a log lift. I think it was the Austrian Oak. And as far as I remember it, uh, no one else had lifted it yet. It, it, some kind of overhead lift. And then I think you were the first one to do it. Um, and you got a rep or two. And then I remember Zavikas getting, and because that was his lift, listen, different strongman, and he just repped it out like it was a, like it was a baby. I, I, again, I don't say that to it because then you went and you, you came back and you won. This is not a slight at all. But what was that moment like for you? Because it was so... Uh, Mind blowing how how strong he was in very specific facets back then. Sure, we. Um, I mean, there was. Uh, th th I don't know exactly what moment you're talking about there, but there was definitely times where he had events, especially with the log, because that that's. Uh, I mean, he's been pretty open saying that's been his favorite lift by far um, overall, and so he had those moments with the log, whereas I had kind of those moments with lifting stones which is more of kind of my specialty yeah um lift where you know he couldn't do those things so in a lot of ways i think that's what made our rivalry great yeah. is that he had different strengths than i did and, and it was always trying to keep up you know for me keep up with him the best i could on law like his best events and then the same for him yeah um and i think that we've we forced each other to get better, which made it, you know, it made it great, really. Yeah. It really was an era that was very fun to watch. And I just asked because I always wonder what it's like to be like the world's, the strongest guy everywhere you go. And then in one event, one guy is just, you're like, oh, oh I like it for a little bit. <laughs> one, one word is frustrating. I don't, I don't like any, yeah, I, I never liked that. It was, you know, because you put all this hard training into doing it. And, and then, you know, if you go in and have an event like that where he would do so well, and I had trained so hard to be better at it. It was just kind of like, man, you, you walk away frustrated from moments like that, for sure. Still pretty strong in my book. Um, number nine, this is going to be one that might surprise some people. The first time Nick DiPaolo was on. And this is episode 73. It was just a big deal for me because he's one of my favorite stand-up comedians ever. So I grew up watching him. And as a matter of fact, I, when I used to watch him, I would almost feel bad about myself because I thought... I will never, ever be able to achieve with it. I will never be as good of a stand-up comedian as, as Nick DiPaolo. Uh, and I did that. I did that one. In art, I would 
whenever I was drawing when I was younger, I would always like look at like the best and I'd be like, I'm never going to get uh, there. Like, uh, I'm just going to start smoking <laughs> crack. Um, and he was also really nice, too, Nick. He was really nice. Uh, I, I got to know him on a personal level. We spent like an hour on the phone, and he didn't disappoint. It was just bust a gut, fu- pee yourself funny. So episode 73, it, it was hard to even pick. Just take your pick, Nick DiPaolo, hysterical. It was me basically meeting one of my comedy idols. Do you follow mixed martial arts at all? I know you're a sports guy, but do you follow uh, like the UFC? Yeah. I choked out my wife last night. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's a good example. Hillary, you know, at that black radio station saying that she had hot sauce. Oh, my gosh. We ran with and that. It, uh, and, and we had that in a loop like a morphine drip. That's the best way to lose votes with black. She was pandering. Everybody in the room know it. When, when they said, what are you carrying in your purse? They would have had more respect for her if she said, well, thanks to your people, I carry mace. <laughs> and... and, and you you are, are right in that mix, but yeah, Klein and Carlin and, and obviously Cosby until you know the kind of whole rape thing. But um, there are people like what happened to Cosby? Well, you know he raped he raped the equivalent to a small Haitian village. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, don't... I, I met him. I, I think he is guilty because I met him once. I shook his hand after a show in Atlantic City about fifteen years ago. Next thing you know, I wake up. I'm wearing nothing but a Temple T-shirt and said. <laughs> There's a bunch of pudding pop wrappers stuck in my back, and I, I don't know what happened. All right, and clocking in at number eight, and you might think, why isn't he higher up on the list? They're, they're, it's just hard to make a list. These are it's just, they're just numbered because we have to. Yeah, uh, no George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre, episode 134. Not only is he my favorite fighter of, of all time, if I had to pick one, it would probably be George St. Pierre. And of course, because I'm from, from Montreal, and I know a lot of people, their eyes are glazing over, oh, <laughs> UFC fight. It's not, it's not about... Uh, the, the sport of fighting. It's not about the UFC. If you go watch a documentary on George St. Pierre, there's one called, I think, The DNA of, of George St. Pierre. It's done by the same people who do all these Discovery Channel films, like about wolves. Very, very well done. Again, you realize the same thing that you see with Brian Shaw. The consistency with people who are at a very, very high level are people who are self-conscious to a degree, but confident. They all realize they could do something great. They said, okay, I, I believe I can be the best at this. And then the level of discipline that most people will never fully comprehend. But my favorite moment from this in episode 134, George St. Pierre. So he was on the program. He couldn't. He, we couldn't get Skype working, so he called in. And um, there was a special that he did on the UFC Countdown, where his French Canadian mom in French was complaining when the cameraman came in, saying, "I don't, you know, don't show them my dusty basement." So George St. Pierre is known to be a little bit robotic or, or, or stiff because he's very professional. A lot of people don't realize it's just the way French Canadians are. It almost seems like a fake accent. That's how half of my family sounds. And the moment that stood out to me was when my mom asked George St. Pierre if the basement was still dusty. And if you can speak French, it's, it's hard to fully uh, uh, translate. You can read the subtitles. But he relaxes and he actually goes into talking and almost almost justifying like no 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 the thing is my mom was just upset about this and this is the and it became a really personal conversation between my mom and ufc legend possibly <laughs> the best combat athlete ever george st pierre episode 134. can i ask you ma ma uh she has a question for you in french can you take one question yeah. for she's a super fan okay ma <laughs> Hello, George. Je suis probablement un de tes de tes plus grands fans. Je t'adore. Hey, man, plus plus proche à le microphone. <laughs> she's freaking. She's she's nervous for people watching. Get yeah. get up close to the microphone. Okay. So, j'ai regardé un un reportage uh, qu'on fait sur toi. Puis euh, ta pauvre mère euh, était bien insultée à cause de, de son sous-sol que quelqu'un lui a dit qu'il y avait bien de la poussière. Puis elle a dit c'est pas de ma faute, c'est parce qu'ils l'ont pas fini. <rire> fait que je veux juste savoir s'ils ont fini le sous-sol pour ta mère. <rire> non, non, ils n'ont pas fini parce que ils ont pas fini parce que parce que le sous-sol en fait. Hein, on le garde comme une salle de jeu pour les pour les enfants à ma soeur. Ah. Donc, euh, on ne on sait pas encore. Les enfants vont, vont grandir un jour. Donc, si on décide de, de, de mettre des, des chambres ou des, des d'autres installations, ben, il va falloir le changer dans quelques années. Donc, c'est pour ça qu'on le garde comme ça, parce qu'il euh, y a un punch in bag, il y a des trucs, euh, des, des jeux, des jouets pour les, les enfants. Donc, si on décide de le changer, ça va être de l'argent perdu pour rien. It's gonna be, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. She asked me about the. Yeah, also, she, she was asking about uh, about the basement because your mom. By the way, for people who don't know, this is such a French Canadian thing. George knows this. Like French Canadians, they keep their houses so clean. Jared, you know that with my mom. She's like, she can't handle it. And George St. Pierre's mom was so mad and especial that they showed a basement which was dusty. So my mom asked if it was still dusty, and, and George said yes because they're keeping it as a play area for the kids, right? Yeah, they, they you keep it for the kids because there's like a it's like a playground for the kid. But if if we if we if finish it and we make like rooms and the walls and everything, it, it, in right now it's 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 gonna be useless because we want it to be for for the kids, for the my sister's kids. But but if if uh, maybe maybe in a in a few years when they grow up, we're gonna they, I guess my parents are gonna be willing to change. Uh, <laughs> I even offered her to pay for the renovation and everything, and, and she convinced me that right now it's a bad bad idea. So. Yeah, just because she doesn't want to have to clean it up again, because French Canadians clean up everything as mm. you're finished eating, they clean up the place. <laughs> uh, well, I, she was she was very very insulted that they say what. That's the basement, but, you know, it is my mom. My mom is like that. Uh, my mom's everything be looking good on camera and this. That's it. My mom, we were sitting there watching the special, and my mom's like, oh, oh. She's like, poor woman. I'm like, mom, are you not watching the greatest fighter of all time? The countdown is about him fighting. You're, and she wouldn't stop about the dust in the basement and how it bad about she about the dust in the basement, not the, not the, the fighter. No, no, no. But then she watched the fight because she's like, I want to watch him. Is his mother is care about the dust in the basement. I'm going to watch to support him. So, you know. You never know how you'll get a new fan. <laughs> That's funny. By the way, the basement is still dusty. Uh, number seven, <laughs> Thomas Thomas Soul. Uh, this was, was episode 310. And, you know, a couple of reasons why. First off, this was the first of the sort of new, the newer media, new school podcast to have Thomas Soul on. He didn't do yeah. it. Uh, he, he's notoriously difficult to book. And then after he did this, he started doing some some more shows, I believe, and, and um, really enjoyed his experience. He was just really, really easy to work with. And when it comes to economists, you'd be hard pressed to find someone uh, more prolific than Thomas Sowell in our generation. I grew up on him. Uh, he's a huge part of my my worldview and, and, and how I've learned economics. And uh, he's a huge, he's one of the number one recommendations. I've talked about the John Stossel, Thomas Sowell, and of course, going back to Adam Smith. But going back to that, it's a little, little bit tough. It's kind of like going back and reading some old timey. Thomas Sowell <laughs> brings it to now. And it's it's tough to, to pick a moment. But you know what was really great um, about Thomas Sowell was I didn't expect this. You could see him loosen up. And he was actually... He was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun. He was very down to earth. And I think we got to see a side of Thomas Sowell that you don't often see. So this is episode 310, Thomas Sowell. How does it feel to be argu arguably the most influential, certainly probably the most influential conservative economist of our time? I know, I know you have to be humble, but ha has it set in? I mean, because you're that guy. Well, I, 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 I never contradict the opinions of people who say, say good things about me. <laughs> because there's so few of them. Uh, <laughs> but I, I really don't, don't, don't try. It would be impossible to be objective about oneself. And so I, I never try the impossible. Could you maybe expand on uh, more so the myth that if not for discrimination, society would have equal representation in careers, income, education, and incarceration. Because that's the huge uh, sort of, uh, I guess, main tenet of, of leftism that's taught on campus. If not for discrimination, we'd all have these equal representation outcomes. It, you, you, you put your finger on, on the key assumption on which the whole, it's like the keystone that holds up the whole structure, and you remove that, and they don't have very much. <laughs> uh, age uh, age is, one, is one of those things, but what people desire to do matters. Right. Uh, you know, uh, for all I know, I might have been born, you know, with, with genes that would have enabled me to become another new, <clears throat> Rudolph Nureyev as a male ballet dancer. Okay. If I was, it was a total waste of genes. Right. Because where I grew up, nobody ever thought about, no, no guy has ever thought about becoming male ballet dancers. So it doesn't matter what their uh, uh, abilities were. It doesn't matter whether there were was the opposition or the gates of, uh, of, of uh, opportunity were wide open. They weren't going to become male ballet dancers. <laughs> but what people uh, want to do is huge. All right, number six. Uh, this one is that a lot of you may not even. There's no number to the episode because this is before no number. we back. actually had episodes. Way it's back. it's not before we went daily. It's before this show was a show at all, even as a podcast. This is back when we were on radio, and we used to tape 
our calls if we could Skype people, but uh, we, we didn't really know what to do with it. So we finally learned how to record the Skype video to decent quality, and we started uploading these. So this is actually Carly Fiorina from August, yeah, August 7th, 2015. You can search it on YouTube. That's the only place to find it. Just Carly Fiorina, Steven Crowder. Search the channel and go through all of the suggested Young Turks videos because it'll, <laughs> it'll take you a <laughs> while. Do you realize that half of these interviews when I was searching through YouTube is to what? My interview with this person is not even the first thing that pops up. No. It's a bunch of random crap with no views. They just stick everything over, like, oh. Trying, they're just piling on. They're, they're just, just putting it piling in. on. It's, it's like a sandwich, only there's only we're just the bottom bread. Exactly. And every, there's, a, there's top bread, there's a whole layer of ham and vegetables, and then we're just, we're like the saucer plate. That's too small no. for the sandwich. If you we're the it. meat. No, we're not. We're the we delicious want to be the meat. meat. We want to be the meat. <laughs> But not to YouTube. <laughs> no, not YouTube. Don't say delicious meat on this program. Um, Carly, <laughs> so Carly Fiorina, here's why this stands out to me so much. We had been writing about her. So ladderwithcrowder.com, a lot of people now who just watch the show don't realize it's the website was a lot bigger than the show for a long time, edited by Courtney uh, Kirchhoff, and she still edits over there. Uh, wonderful, fantastic writer. We'd been writing about Carly Fiorina for a long time. I had seen her speak at a private event and thought, wow, this woman's really impressive. And then I watched back then during these primaries, they had the second stage debates, people who didn't necessarily make it to the, the, the first stage. Um, and we were writing about Carly Fiorina. I called her, I think we coined the term the conservative honey badger. And then at one point we started calling her the conservative spider monkey on crack because of the way she went after Katie Couric. <laughs> and so when we reached out to her people, I thought, oh no, she, I, I found out she had heard Spider Monkey on crack, <laughs> and she loved it. Turns out she liked it, and she came on the show. So she was she was she wasn't doing any any you know any podcast circuits or local radio anything like that. And here's why this is so um, pivotal to me because you don't know this when you watch this interview. She gave us this interview. She was at the event green room, I believe, or another conference room, right before 45 minutes before she walked on stage that night and then pulled ahead to number one in the polls. If you remember, there was a moment where Carly Fiorina just pulled ahead, and I, I will say it was kind of, it, it was mismanaged a little bit by some of the handlers, but no one knew who she was. She came out on stage that night and the whole world was talking about Carly Fiorina. 45 minutes before that, this is what you see on Skype. Also, we got Carly Fiorina to say that other uh, Republicans, the, the males in particular, needed to grow a pair. Watch. Clarify your stance so that no one else is misquoting on immigration, what would a Carly Fiorina administration do? What I have said consistently all along is, number one, we have to secure the border. By the way, how long have we been talking about securing the border? Uh, 30 years. I mean, to be accurate, the border has not been secure for 30 years. We've been talking about it for at least 25. It's still not secure. So what does that tell you? It tells you politicians talk, 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 and yet it never gets done. Sanctuary cities. You know how long San Francisco has been a sanctuary city? Since 1989. Everyone's going to get all fired up about this. They're going to give speeches. They're going to pass laws. And yet nothing really changes. This is why people are fed up with the political class. So number one, secure the border. This isn't rocket science. It takes money. It takes manpower. It takes technology. But mostly what it takes is to grow a pair and lead. And I think that Carly Fiorina, uh, if I may so, I want to say so respectfully, is fine. Also, uh, number five, <laughs> Daniel Cormier, a lot of ladies like like him. So he's he's uh, he's the current UFC light heavyweight champion. Another big dude. Yes. Well, actually, he's not that big. Not that big for a heavyweight. The guy he could technically big. fight as a man. He, well, he's scary. No, he's about 5'10", five, 5'9", five, oh, well. fighting heavyweights. He's and like, he fought at five yeah. at 205 uh, and, and won the title there and then moved up. So right now he's the current lineal... Uh, light heavyweight champion and UFC heavyweight champion, and he's a former Olympian. He's one of the main commentators uh, on ESPN. It was Fox Sports 1, I think now over there at ESPN. Episode 363. I didn't think he was going to come on the show. And we've been very fortunate to have a lot of people who are not necessarily conservatives, not necessarily politically minded come on the show, and, and every now and then it's a crapshoot. What I really liked about Daniel Cormier, not only was he funny, obviously, I mean, people know he's very charismatic, but he was very vulnerable. So there's a moment there, if you watch, where he talks about how scared he was before he absolutely blitzed Stipe Miocic to win the title. And he talks about th this moment of the, ex the excuses he was making for himself uh, beforehand. And I think it's something you don't often see because when you're doing the UFC countdowns, right, you're trying to intimidate the opponent. Uh, and often when you're going on podcasts, you're trying to promote something. He didn't have anything to promote, 
we didn't need to, to pull anything out of him politically, socially. I just, just wanted to hear what it was like to be Daniel Cormier, what it was like to win that title. And, uh, man, it was, it was, it was, uh, re- we were really fortunate to, to get a, a yeah. vulnerable Daniel Cormier who was just uh, completely candid. There you go. How did you do it? Did you always believe and know that you were going to be here? What's that like? What are the doubts like along that path? Uh, you know, man, the crazy thing is, it's like when you, when you deal with a lot of these things that I've dealt with, you know, especially the tragedies in life, you can either suck it up or you can say, you know what, my, my, my journey's done. You know, I knew that the best way to honor all the people that I've lost, especially Caden, uh, was to do something truly, truly special. So use it as a motivating factor in my life, and that's what I've done. Um, I feel like all the 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 the, the near the, the very close calls I had with becoming the best mm-hmm. uh, led to that moment on um, on on July seventh uh, or July 9th when I fought Stepe. Uh, but come on, that's the biggest event have... ever. It's give or t- give or take yeah. a couple of days. I have a lot of things going on. <laughs> I'm being chauffeured. I, I'm trying to really make myself seem more busy than I am. I gotta be honest. With you. <laughs> but uh, I really did know the date. I did know the date. I was just pretending. You guys called me out. I, I appreciate but, your candor. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, we. I doubt myself. You know, I'm like, man, 39 years old. You know. You know what the craziest thing was? Like, before the fight with Stipe, being that he was the guy that defended the belt three times and he was the most successful heavyweight champ of all time, yeah. I'm in the back in the locker room, and I'm walking back and forth, and these are thoughts that I'm having to myself because my coaches and teammates are all excited. I'm telling myself, win or lose, I'm 39 years old, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm never fighting again. I don't need to deal with this anxiety. It's over. I was like, I was like trying to give myself reasons why I was going to lose the fight. It was, I, I was like, what is going on? Number four, uh, not as tough as Daniel Cormier, uh, Senator Ted Cruz. Particularly the first, <laughs> the first episode, uh, 122, I think. And then it was, yeah, then 271. He's been on a few times. But particularly the first one. And the reason for this was the first time he came on, it was after Carly Fiorina. He was uh, a favorite, I think, at this point to become president. Not a favorite, but it was between him and Donald Trump. The yeah, lion Ted. And uh, it was a side uh, uh, to Ted Cruz that no one had seen before. We got so many comments like, I used to hate Ted Cruz. And then I saw this and I realized he's actually a likable guy. And that's, that's one thing I think uh, that this show has provided, or at least I'm, I'm really grateful that we try to provide the opportunity to guests to, to, to let their freak flag fly, right? That's, yeah. that's the opportunity. For Ted Cruz, I know he has to go on a debate and he has to be professional and he has to be buttoned up. And unfortunately, he has like an audiographic memory is what I've heard where that's why everything sounds like it's, but he's just that way. You can hear when we talk to him off air, he's like, well, Next time, we're, maybe we can grab a grill. Like, is, there, is there someone, is there a consultant here? Is, there, uh, is this being recorded right now? Is this right being now? recorded? You're on candid camera. Okay, well, that's creepy. Uh, but um, the first interview, episode 122, he, still, he was actually a lot funnier than most people thought he would be. And uh, he was a lot more relaxed. And that actually, I think, changed... Well, I know changed quite a few uh, public opinions about him. This was at the time, you know, the Bernie Bros and sort of the alt right yeah. Pepe the Frog, and, and Ted Cruz wasn't really being examined by a lot of people. So um, it was interesting to me at that time to see that shift. It doesn't pass a sniff test because either way, it's a moment of silence. Do you yell "Praise Jesus, Praise Jesus, Praise Jesus" during Remembrance Day silence? Because I tell you to shut up. Uh, look, 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 a moment of silence is is not that complicated to figure out how to do. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're funny. You're funny. You're good. Let that show a little more in the debates. I think people want to see that from you because you're good at it. And uh, I dig it, man. Well, thank you, Stephen. We're doing it all the time. When, I, when I'm on the trail, when we're doing town halls, this is what we're doing. The media doesn't show it. Right. As we move closer to the election, we'll communicate directly. But, but I'll give you something that was just a week ago. I was up in New Hampshire, did a breakfast meeting. Um, and at the end of it, they asked me about my favorite movie. My favorite movie is The Princess Bride. Oh, and, and, well, we're going to have to disagree on that one, but go ahead. Well, well, then you may not like what I'm going to say next, oh. but with a little bit of prodding, uh, <laughs> they, they, they got me to recreate the entire scene where Miracle Max is, is resuscitating the Dread Pirate Roberts. And so okay. if you want to Google and see me doing impressions of Billy Crystal and Carol Kane and Carrie Elwes and Manny Patankin, that, that happened a week ago on, on New Hampshire television, and, and if you want a link to it, my guess is people may chuckle. But I will give one defense of myself. All right. All right. A good impression is good. 
a bad impression is better. People laugh much more at a bad impression, and I do bad impressions very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator. The number three actually was Joe Rogan episode, um, uh, was it 123, Joe Rogan? I think it's episode 123. You can also find it on YouTube if you're, if you're watching this, of course. And again, send your favorite guests uh, to us uh, just in the comment section, or you can uh, tweet it, and we'll, we'll, we'll see who we can get on the show. Yeah. Sometimes they don't want to come on the show. Oh, yeah. I don't blame you know. them. But here's why with Joe Rogan. This actually came, this happened on the heels of an appearance I made in the Joe Rogan podcast, and the appearance has now <laughs> gone semi-viral, where uh, we <laughs> talked about marijuana. And my, my position, I don't want to get into this. My position is I don't care if you want to smoke pot. I, I, I don't care if you want to get high. I, I, I couldn't care. I don't think that states not only should legalize whatever medical marijuana, if they want to legalize it, do whatever you, just know the ramifications and just don't tell me it cures cancer. That's all. That's all. If states want to do it, that's my opinion. Legalize crack. Yes. Yeah. I actually, honestly, if a state wants to legalize heroin, constitutionally, I find it hard to argue against it. Oh, that's true, yeah. I don't like heroin personally. Anyway, so Joe Rogan it's and not, I it's not for me. Got, got into uh, on the show. It, it, it became pretty heated. And I know he didn't mean for it to be heated, and I didn't want for it to be heated. And after that, he was really great. He's always been so gracious as a host, Joe Rogan. And um, the reason this one, when he, he came on my show, meant a lot. A, he doesn't go on a lot of people's shows. B, the next day, and he did not have to do this, he released this apology on Instagram because he didn't feel good about how our interaction went. And um, he, had, he did not need to do that. I, I think it, it wasn't nearly as hostile as people wanted it to be. Hmm. And that's why it went viral. And the reason him coming on the show, I think, is is important. It means a lot to me. Is, is, is that sometimes public perception isn't reality. Uh, after that, I've, I've done his show a few times, and it, they've always been fun. I've always had a good time with Joe, and I like him a lot, and I respect him a lot uh, as a person and as, as a host. I mean, he's a trailblazer for podcasting. So I think for a lot of people, they thought that they had seen a feud, and for him to come on the show the next day and explain that there wasn't, he didn't need to apologize. It's not because he apologized. Uh, it didn't warrant an apology from him. But um, the fact that he kind of said, you know what, listen, I realize you know, you, you're in a, in a place where a lot of people uh, disagree with you. You're used to kind of having to protect yourself, be combative, and uh, I didn't feel good about putting you in that position. He didn't do anything wrong, but it was cool to me and I hope important to the viewer to see that sometimes a lot of these feuds, a lot of the gossip that you read, it's, it's, it's not real life. And uh, so here you go, just a brief clip from, from Joe Rogan, who was very, very gracious and has done a lot for the program. I don't think you're a conservative at all, but I think you're a free speech and a free thinking advocate, which kind of eliminates you to, from today's regressive left. Isn't that bizarre? I mean, the, when I was a kid, my parents were hippies. And I grew up thinking that the left was all the people that were trying to stop this unjust war in Vietnam. And, you know, they were trying to uh, enable the civil rights movement to succeed and enable free speech and uh, enable people to speak freely. Right. That's just not the case anymore. We're in some weird down is up and up is down time. Yeah. And uh, for people like myself who do have a lot of left wing ideas, you know, who do support gay marriage, who do support so many uh, what you would consider left ideas. Yeah. You find yourself in this this strange place where you're so I'm so opposed right. to so much of these attacks on free speech and so much of the uh, aggre I mean, I don't even want to call it bullying because it's more of a mob mentality thing. Right. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Like the Berkeley thing with Milo was scary. Yeah. You know, yeah. And this mischaracterization, mis mischaracterization of his positions on things is scary. They're making it out like he's this evil hate monger who wants genocide. Right. And this is all just to justify some of the crazy things that they're doing, smashing Starbucks windows, lighting cop cars on fire. You know, all this chaos that you're seeing well, that's being perpetrated by the left, someone like myself, I, I cannot identify with that. I do not understand it. And right. it puts me at odds. But, you know, I don't, I'm like a man without a country now. After that, I'm pretty sure he smoked weed. He would tell you himself. Yeah. Uh, number two, Ralph Macchio, episode 336. This is this why, is you know, at one point, if you would have had Ralph Macchio, kind of like at one point before Desperate Housewives, if you were to say Terry Hatcher, people were like, well, that, that person from Lois and Clark. Uh, but oh, then she yeah. became an A-lister again with 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 uh, Desperate Housewives. Yeah, I mean Dean Cain completely overshadows her. In that yeah, show, Dean Cain. So Dean Cain is just. I mean, he's I mean, just. He's he's prettier than Terry Hatcher, if that's possible. 
No it comment. is possible. I said it. I stand by it. Um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, he's so, he's so good looking that they, they, they relabeled on Netflix Lois and Clark lesbian cosplay. It's hard to find. <laughs> so Ralph Macchio, at one point, if you'd say Ralph Macchio, you'd be like, well, come on. He was a big star in the 80s and 90s. But Cobra Kai had come out on YouTube Red, okay? And the reason this is number two and why it's, why it's so important to me, this is a pivotal moment for this show. Uh, and I think for online entertainment in general, for a lot of YouTube people out there, for podcasters out there, for people who've come. So it's this race to the middle is what people talk about. You know, you used to have Johnny Carson, right? He was the only late night show at that point. And then it got split and you had Letterman and, and, and Leno. And then you had shows after them. And then it was, okay, Letterman, Leno and Conan. And the numbers went down. And now you have Colbert and Kimmel and, uh, and uh, Fallon and Conan. And I don't know. I don't know Nobody's if George still has a show. But the point is, and then you have Samantha Bee and Trevor Noah. Uh. And so the networks, were there used to only be three. Uh, then cable fragmented it, and their numbers have been doing this. At the same time, people who started online, YouTube, I mean, you can go check out our, I think my YouTube channel's been up since 2006. We didn't really upload anything back then. Uh, we've been doing this, and, and they've been doing this, and it's this race to the middle. When we started this show, you know, we, there were a lot of people who wouldn't come on the show. Uh, and rightfully so. And if you still don't want, if they still don't want, rightfully so. I don't... I wouldn't, uh, but um, <laughs> what was so interesting, so Ralph Macchio is, I don't, I don't know his political persuasions at all, but what was interesting to me was at this point in time, we've said, we're never going to have the ratings of, of, of I don't know, American Idol or Johnny Carson again. Well, actually, they do exist. They exist in the show Cobra Kai, YouTube Red, I think it was 30 something million. Yeah. A show? Yeah. I, I had heard 36 million. 36 million people. It's a good show. It's a great show. It's a really, really good show. So not only do I love the show Cobra Kai, I highly recommend it. It's one of the few sort of comedies in recent memory that I can say works really well. Um, not only am I a Ralph Macchio fan, not only was he a good guest, but this was an interesting flip where at one point people who would be on ABC, CBS, uh, NBC wouldn't come on a show like this. And now they would kill for the ratings that Cobra Kai was getting. And Ralph Macchio was the lead in because he saw the value in reaching out to the audience who, who, who supported him with Cobra Kai. He came on this show. So it really was um, a, a changing of the guard. So episode 336. And, and one thing, too, a moment here that I really enjoyed was there, a lot of people don't realize Ralph Macchio is a really good actor. It's overshadowed by a lot. He's a really, really good actor, and so I wanted to ask him about a very specific moment that struck a chord with me in Karate Kid, and uh, he told me off air that he really appreciated it, and I know it, it touched him, and I'm very grateful that he's been on the show. Ralph Macchio. It's such a great job. For people who don't know what they're watching, because a lot of people, they just watch films, and they see it from an entertainment standpoint. That's one shot. You're conveying a lot of different emotions. Anger to helplessness to desp wanting to go to a karate school, the, the losing it in your voice. I mm. always watch that scene and say, people don't realize how well performed the scene. How many takes did that take? And how did you get into that headspace? Because it really is something uh, incredible to watch. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And it was nice to, it was even nice to just revisit that audio wise, um, because, uh, you know, we watched this film a, a bunch of time over, over the years. Uh, that's the great Randy Heller also playing uh, Mrs. LaRusso, who uh, right. is a nice, without making spoilers, it's a nice <laughs> Easter egg, and I just gave it away right, yeah. in our series. Um, and we're hoping to uh, to have, have that role and other actors from back then, uh, back in, in the future of the Cobra Kai show. The You know, the scene, we did it a bunch of times. Uh, some of it was because the camera, you know, some of it was on me, some of it was on... Uh, the camera, you know, we didn't get it perfect each every single time. And I think if I you actually watch that take, if you really analyze it, there's one point where the steady cam just does a little bit of a oh. of a of a wobble. Am I there? It should be back. There we go. Okay, there. there's that wonderful point. Okay, so continue. You're saying the, the the camera got a little crooked. Right. So the camera got a little a little um, you know it had a little wobble in it. And and by technical perfection standards, you would say, hmm, let's go again. We have a little bit of. But the performance credit the director, um, you know, you go with, you always go with performance because that stuff falls away. Right. You know, that stuff you don't notice. Um, I think that that, that scene did have a, have a lot of levels. I mean, the whole, I hate this bike, this stupid bike, that was all John Avelson saying, when you walk up, you know, I think he was trying to help me get to that level. Yeah. And he had me walk down and keep throwing, he said, just keep throwing it in there. He said, go back, do it again. And he had the camera rolling and I, I had to do it like three and four times, sometimes per take, just pick it up. So when and they said, take it out again and do it again. And he was, I think what he was doing, I'm sure what he was doing was getting me to that 
right. place of, uh, of frustration and build all that level of emotion. Um, the, the line when he says, not at not a, not a, not a, not a, the Y at a real school was basically Ralph Macho forgetting the line and, <laughs> and figuring it out. As at I'm going, a good a, school. I know what it says. Uh, and uh, so that. that you know what's uh, funny? We quote that in our house all the time. When I was a kid, like if we had a problem or something, I'd be like, I got to take karate, ma, not at the Y yeah. at a good school. And it was just, That's right. no, it's, it's sort it's of a line great. in the house. I think it's it's a it's a credit to all of us working together. A well written scene, a fantastic director, a beautiful and and wonderful actress to play opposite. We had a great chemistry together, and um, and it's just one of those that uh, that we caught on film. You know, it doesn't always happen. And he's still cute as a button, Ralph Macchio. <laughs> I bet you Elizabeth Shue still get herself a piece of that. Um, <laughs> now, number one, the number one interview. All right, let me see. Let's see if you can guess. I want put in the comment section your guess before. Don't skip ahead. Yeah, well, don't skip. Yeah, don't skip ahead. Cheater. Guess. Five, four, three. Okay, you've guessed. Then come back and let me know if you were right. The number one interview that I've ever conducted on a show that stands out is um, not a celebrity at all. Stephen Williford. Yeah, I know a lot of people. A lot of you are probably, probably saying who. So this was there was far deadlier actually than the Parkland shooting. One of the worst shootings and mass shootings in modern history was in uh, Sutherland Springs, outside of San Antonio, where a guy opened fire on a church, and um, he was stopped by a man who was an NRA certified instructor with an AR-15. That man was Stephen Williford. Badass. He was a badass man. He's been he, he, so he. he he actually wasn't doing a whole lot of media. He did one local media appearance because someone was an actual friend of his who he worked with. But this was the first, and as, as far as I know it, the only one for a long time. As far as now, now my mouth is getting dry. So here, hold on, listen to this. This, this, is, this, this, is, this is what happens when it's live. It's ASMR. I don't even know what that means. Stop being disgusting. Um, so Stephen, Stephen Williford. Um, turned out he was a fan of the show. I think, his, I think his daughter was a Mug Club member, and uh, they reached out to us because we reached out and said, hey, listen, I, I know you're b just being bombarded. He was holed up in his house effectively because press wouldn't leave him alone at that point, but they didn't really want to tell the story. They wanted to see kind of what, what had happened, but no one in the press was really covering that an NRA certified instructor took out a guy with an AR-15. And sure enough, sure as they came, the press was gone really, really quickly. That was a story that, <laughs> like a fought in the wind, it was gone. And... His daughter, I believe, spoke with our, our booker on the show and said, you know, it's, it's really important that he go on a program that, where I, I, I trust that he'll be represented fairly and allowed to speak. And I really do think, as, as someone who's watched the show, I, I, I think this would be good for him. Um, and so he did. He came on the show. And that was, you know, it's, it, w the reason it meant something to me was not because it was uh, an exclusive a, a scoop. I mean, that's that's always a, nice. I'm not going to lie and say that it, it wasn't a big deal that we had this exclusive. But um, it was really hard for me. I remember going into it s s saying uh, I, to myself, I, I don't want to do the Barbara Walters thing. I don't want I don't want to make him cry. This is a guy who's just been mm. through a, a traumatic event, who just shot somebody, who just had friends of his die, and I don't want to exploit it. But they did reach out to us and say this would be good for him to get this out and finally sp speak about it. And it was a, a real challenge to try and balance this uh, interview. And you know, he started crying on air when describing this at one point. And it kind of reminded me of, of Tom Hanks and Punchline where he's on stage asking someone to help him. And so I wanted to jump in and help him where I could, but give him the floor where he needed it. And a lot of people reached out and said, hey, we re really appreciate that you did that and that we were able to hear a story because no one had heard it from the media yet. And his family actually um, sent me some very nice messages and they were, they were very grateful. So I, it was hard for me not to cry. If you go back and watch the full interview, episode 257, uh, Stephen Williford, right after the Sutherland Springs shooting, it was very difficult for me to keep my composure to try and Handle this. You know, this is what happens sometimes in life. You're never prepared for it. You just have to do it. There, most things, if you think about turning moments in your life, you're not prepared. You've just got to step up. And that's what happened here with Stephen Williford. I did the best that I could. And seeing him at the end of this interview, when he was going through these harrowing details, a nightmare, and he was crying on air, I was very emotional, but then getting him to laugh a little bit. And that's what his, his family said, you know, meant a lot. Um, that's what I can do every now and then. And uh, it meant a lot for, for me to do. And um, it's something I'll never forget.
Stephen Welford. To have that frame of, of mind, and like you said, that foresight, I know people are going to be asking, it, 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 did this come with your NRA instructor training, military background? Because most people would not think to look for this, to be aware of your surroundings. Um, it, is, it is remarkable. Well, that, that, that's what I'm telling you. I can't, I, I can't explain the clarity of mind that I had. I can't explain it. And, and, and not only that, but I was using the neighbor's Dodge pickup truck. He had a four-wheel drive Dodge pickup truck in his driveway, and I was using it. All I had, all he had for a shot for me is my head because I was behind the truck and using it for cover. Okay. And we exchanged fire, and he hit the neighbor's car's windshield. He hit the neighbor's house, and he got into the vehicle, and I fired it again. And he fired two more shots through his side. Well, actually, he fired, fired two shots through his side window first. And it put. And I noticed the, the two distinct pistol shots coming through the sides of the window. And I fired my AR-15 again, and it took the window down. It fell. According to the media, people like you, people as, as pure-hearted and as capable, don't exist. And it is an unbelievable story. We, I mean, you're in it now, but you've, you're, you're a huge uh, moment in history, what you did. Can, can, I, can I say something? And, and I, I don't feel comfortable saying it just anywhere, but maybe with you guys. Sure. Um, if I had run out of the house, and maybe this is a political plug or whatever, but if I had run out of the house with a pistol and faced bulletproof vests and Kevlar helmets, it might have been futile. Right. I know. I can. And, and, and I ran out with an AR-15, and that's what he was shooting the place up with. Right. And, it's, and, and I, I hate to politicize that, but that's reality. I was terrified, by the way. Yeah. I'm, I'm no brave man. I was terrified. <laughs> I can imagine. That's what makes you brave. You know, I, I, my, my dad told me that when I was young. Do you know what the definition of... He had that conversation with me. He said, do you know what brave is? I said, it means not being afraid. He said, no, it means doing the right thing in the face of being afraid. No one expects you to be fearless. No one expects you to go out there and be John Rambo. Um, I would imagine that uh, if it were me, I'd be yelling to my wife to get my brown pants. I would have long since soiled <laughs> myself. There you go. Hey, at least I brought some laughter into that. Uh, hopefully uh, made your day a little brighter. And he's been, he's been on the show since, by the way, also, Stephen Williford. So we made sure to follow up. We weren't just a lot of these, you know, uh, kind of like David Hogg with those people. Then all of a sudden, everyone who supports David Hogg, where have they, where have they gone? Gone. So he has to start now bashing Nancy. Pelosi. No, we've had Stephen Williford on, and uh, if ever he has something, he's, he doesn't need to promote anything, so he doesn't really often request being on, but no. when he does, we have him on the program. And um, he's become, I'd like to, I, I would say that certainly him or his family members have become friends, and we're really fortunate to know them. So those are the top 10 interviews that stick out in my mind that I've conducted, that I've enjoyed the most, or that have impacted me the most. Comment, again, let me know what you think. Uh, uh, what are, what interviews stand out to you? What, what were your favorite or which interviews maybe made an impact on you that changed your course of thinking or maybe inspired you to, to do something that you thought you would never do? Comment, I wanna hear from you because that's a big part of this show. A big part are the guests and man, they change people's lives, myself and everyone in the studio included. Uh, thank you for watching. We're gonna see you tomorrow with a normal show or maybe a super video. Ooh. Who knows, who knows, Ooh. stay tuned. Hey there, YouTube viewer. If you like this video, you first off should probably seek counseling, but you should subscribe or hit the notification bell or watch one of these videos that's playing. The truth is, I don't know what any of that means anymore. If you try and subscribe or hit the notification bell, you won't be notified. And if you try and click one of these videos, it's just going to take you to BuzzFeed Boldly Fat Broads as they get carried out of their houses where they had to break down the North Wall and they get carried out in a land whale tarp. I don't know what's happening on YouTube. I know what's happening with Mug Club, lotterwithcredit.com slash mug club. You get to watch the daily show one hour every single day, not just clips, along with like 15 other shows for $69 annually if you're a student and, or, or, or veteran or military, and you get to keep us here on YouTube for free because we can, we can irritate them by your support. It's worth it, right?